Thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. I've got a lot of information to cover, so let's let's dive right in. Um, kind of going back to uh, this high path avian influenza outbreak uh, in 2015, we saw different H5 strains, and it really began around December 2014, went all the way to June 2015. Uh, we're looking at 233 premises that were infected. Uh, we had about 212 that were commercial. Uh, 21 backyard, and uh, we're looking at about 50 million birds uh, that were impacted. Um, $1 billion was spent uh, approximately to, for, for USDA stamping this out, and uh, we also saw some trade restrictions in place uh, for both states and, and the U.S. Um, economic hardships to poultry producers, most producers were out of production anywhere from, you know, three months to uh, up to six months. <clears throat> Or more and uh, as far as turkeys impacted uh, 7.5 million turkeys were, were impacted 7% uh, of the average US inventory and, and we're seeing around 42 million chickens that were impacted that's about 10% of that layer inventory uh, if you think of replacements uh, it's going to be about 6% of those replacements so um, you know we saw egg prices go up and it, it actually did have an impact on that consumer as well Flash forward to 2016, and uh, in Indiana, in January, uh, we saw H7N8 affect nine different farms. Um, eight of those were low path. We uh, feel that one of those farms, uh, you know, evolved into a, to a high path farm. So one egg layer facility uh, was impacted, and uh, it is considered a dangerous contact premises. 415,000 birds uh, and about $4 million in indemnity payments. In 2016, we saw a low path avian influenza outbreak, um, and that was H5N1 in uh, Missouri, affected one turkey operation. Um, we were looking at 37,000 birds that were impacted, and uh, they were averaged at about 44 pounds uh, per bird. Transmission, uh, migratory waterfowl, we know that that has uh, been the culprit. Uh, they're natural reservoirs for avian influenza virus. And I try to remind people that, you know, the, the virus is as common as, as human influenza. And uh, the birds naturally carry it. You see low pathogenic forms with very few clinical signs up to your high pathogenic forms where you might have upwards to you know, close to 100% mortality on those. And what we're seeing here is the Eastern, East Asian and Australasian flyway intersecting in Alaska along with the Pacific flyways. And uh, the, the traditional North American low path strains, uh, they're being carried up there by migratory waterfowl and uh, they're commingling with birds from Eastern Asia. We know we've had an issue with high path and Eastern Asia for a long time, and, and we're currently dealing with that right now. And we see genetic reassortment occur, and uh, actually this, this new strain was then carried down into North America. We started seeing that in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but the epicenter of this was in Minnesota and Iowa. Um, that's where we saw several egg layer operations and several uh, commercial turkey operations that were impacted. The euthanasia methods that were used during the, the outbreak include gas, foam was, was commonly used, and then a ventilation shutdown as a last means resort. Um, here's examples of what it looks like when you're foaming a house, and uh, this just cuts off the air supply for that bird. It's an AVMA approved method, and um, once we get to that point, we, this is when guys like me come in and we look at disposal options. So today we're going to outline all those disposal options, uh, some pros and cons to each one, and, and then kind of focus on composting really because during this avian influenza outbreak, about 95% of what uh, we did was actually composting. Uh, burial, landfill, incineration, rendering, composting, all of those are uh, common methods. So with burial, you know you have to have an acceptable land mass. Um, so that, that can be an issue right there. Uh, some poultry operations may only have, you know, one or two acres to deal with. So if, if you don't have that 
land mass, then you can take that one off the table. Site assessment is important. You have to look at environmental guidelines, which will vary from state to state. And uh, examples include depth to groundwater, your distance from waterways, and then what soil type. You know, with a very sandy soil, for example, uh, that wouldn't be something that you would really prefer for uh, pit burial. And, you know, areas where you have poor site selection, those sandy soils like I described, you have high water tables, you have karst topography, all those compose a threat to groundwater contamination. If we're seeing that, uh, then, you know, we wouldn't consider that a site to, to do this. Um, other burial considerations, you know, the, the concern here is if the virus is actually going to get into that environment and uh, if, if those leachate components can actually uh, infiltrate into the groundwater. We know that avian influenza H7N1 can survive for extended periods of time in uh, manure amended soil. And we've also seen where high path AI viruses have survived for weeks in water. Um, the other issue is you're putting these in an anaerobic environment and they're not really uh, fully degrading uh, as if they would if you used another method such as incineration or composting. This is an image of a three-month-old buried carcass and, and you really just don't see this being degraded over time. It takes much longer. Here's some research from Pratt and Fonstad in 2012 and, and what we're looking at here, the darker area is an actual burial pit and um, you can see elk that were, were uh, uh, buried there with chronic wasting disease back in 01, and they actually took soil cores from it uh, seven years later. And, and what we're looking at is ammonia concentrations as they move down into that soil. So the question here is, you know, what is the depth of groundwater and what is the soil type? And then you would assess uh, whether this would be a concern or not. On the right, we're looking at dairy cattle with foot and mouth disease. And uh, then soil cores were taken uh, very, I can't see what my slide says, but I think it's around 50 or 60 years later. Um, and we're seeing these ammonia concentrations that are moving through the soil there as well. So these are some of the considerations. One thing I like about burial would be that it's fast. You can do it on site. And uh, so if you can get the equipment out there and the, the weather conditions are right, uh, they can be put underground pretty quickly. Weather constraints can be an issue, though. So if you have saturated soil, if you have frozen soil, um, that could cause some issues. There's environmental risks as well, uh, potentially. Uh, public perception might be an issue that, that you know, the companies might want to consider. And then there have been states where they have gone back and, and kind of uh, did some develop, land development over some of these pits, and, and you have these, you know, mummified carcasses that, that showed back up. And because of that, uh, some states have, have required a record on deed for the future land use if uh, you're going to use that land again. So that might be a potential uh, implication there, whether or not you'd want to bury. And then I don't really consider it a pathogen activation procedure. Landfills. Um, there are landfills that do accept mortalities, and this requires notification prior to delivery. So you're looking at, you know, twenty to forty dollars per ton in um, fees to uh, to use them. Um, if it is a disease outbreak, you're going to want to require bio bags uh, and roll off containers so that you securely uh, transport these carcasses to that landfill. The pros to this: it, it is fast, so if, uh, if you're in a pinch, you could get those, those carcasses there pretty quickly. The cons, it's privately owned. Um, so that became an issue in Iowa. One day, they, they may state that they will accept these carcasses, and the next day, they may change their mind. So I would want to make sure I have a really good contract and, and uh, understanding between these privately owned landfills as to whether they'll accept the carcasses. And uh, I don't really consider this a pathogen and activation procedure either. Incineration, um, you can use large closed air units. They may require an air quality permit. The pros include, yeah, it is a pathogen activation procedure. Uh, you can do it on site. And some of the cons or considerations would be that uh, it does require several units. It does uh, require, or you have to consider the carcass throughput. So 
you know, if you're looking at a, an egg layer operation with 2 million birds, how many of these birds can you really put through in a 24 hour period? And, uh, and how many of these uh, incinerators would you actually need? Because you're running them 24 seven, maintenance can become an issue. And uh, then if one of them breaks down, you have to consider, you know, what are you gonna do? Uh, where are you gonna go get a spare part? Rendering, uh, that's, that's a good option for cooking carcasses and, and uh, converting them to meat and bone meal and fat as byproducts. Um, it does require bio bags and, and roll off containers. The pros, it would be a pathogen activation procedure. Uh, the cons would be lim limited availability. There's not a whole lot of these around. And then it's a private business that, that may not want to accept the risks of accepting those contaminated carcasses. Um, so, and they would have to do a separate run just for that. So to this point, we haven't really seen that one implemented during these disease outbreaks. Composting. Um, the carcass is surrounded by carbon material, and uh, you see microbial breakdown of the carcass. This, this is what we're do we've done. We've done this anywhere from, you know, turkeys, chickens, horses, cattle. Uh, the end product's the same. You're actually breaking this down into a, a final product, uh, a stable humus-like product. The thermophilic temperatures dest destroys pathogens. And, and really on this, proper construction is key for effectiveness. I can't overemphasize that because I, I've seen where it hasn't been properly constructed and, and we didn't uh, get the, the end result that, that we uh, wanted. But when it is properly constructed, you have the right components in there, it works great. So the pros to composting. You can do it on site, um, so you're not moving these infected carcasses off site. I do see it as a, a pathogen and activation procedure because of the thermophilic temperatures that you're reaching. I think it's environmentally sustainable because instead of sending all these carcasses to, let's say, a landfill, uh, you're actually retaining that material and you're producing a valuable soil amendment and, and a fertilizer. The cons include um, it's going to take some time. You know, you're going to have to devote 28 days to this and you're going to have to have some space to do it. So. You know, if you're talking turkey houses, you've got plenty of space inside. Uh, if you, you look at something like broiler breeders, then, then we start, you know, getting on the fence as to what we should do. But again, proper construction, proper maintenance, and, and monitoring are all fundamental for this to work effectively. Regardless of the plan, uh, keep all the options on the table. And um, because you may not be able to, to compost, uh, you may not be able to bury. So you need to, during a large outbreak, more than likely you'll be implementing several methods. And uh, each of these have pros and cons like I mentioned. What I'm really telling producers right now is have a disposal plan for tomorrow if an outbreak occurs. And um, be because site assessment, the severity of the outbreak, and available resources, uh, they're, they're all key variables on, on what you're going to choose. So for example, on the site assessment, I only have a couple of acres there. Uh, I may not be burying, okay? If uh, during a, a large outbreak, um, we may have taken all our carbon resources and uh, we don't have any more, so composting's off the table. What I always encourage is that the depopulation crew and the disposal crews are coordinating together because what can happen is during a stamping out event, uh, you're wanting to euthanize as many of these infected animals as fast as possible. But you always have to have a plan on what comes next. And the last thing you want are a bunch of euthanized uh, animals that, that are just, you know, degrading uh, there. So always have that disposal plan that's going to quickly, very quickly, immediately, if you will, follow that depopulation plan. And if you're composting, have a carbon source and route. If you're considering this, I'd get on the phone today, start calling suppliers, seeing what they have. And, and maybe getting some, some agreements made. 